Good evening and, and welcome. I'm Paolo Carazza, the director of the Kellogg Institute for International Studies, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this evening and to be introducing my friend Paul Farmer. I could, uh, as would be customary on such an occasion, introduce Paul by listing all of his various titles and accomplishments and accolades, his university professorship at Harvard, the highest status of a faculty member there, the many books that he's written and awards that he's received. But really, for one thing, you all know that already. I don't need to tell you. That's why you're here. Secondly, in some ways, it would be a supreme irony to be representing to you Paul Farmer in the language of the conventional symbols of status in the academy and in the world of international development because his entire life, in fact, has been about questioning and disrupting those categories exactly in ways that get more to the reality of development and of the life of the poor and of the need for health. Paul's life has always been about the real, not about the superficial. And I could tell the stories instead that would get at that, and I'd prefer to, beginning, well, I suppose, according to your mother, from the days you collected insects in the swamps of Florida. I won't go that far back because people are here to hear you, not to hear me, but I will go back at least as far as this, to the mid-1980s. Uh, and I actually begin the story with myself. I took my first trip to Haiti in 1987. I spent my first time in, in Haiti in 1987 as an aspiring young human rights lawyer at the time and spent a summer there working. Uh, Haiti at the time for me was a fascinating, beautiful, captivating, and deeply troubling place, a raw place that I didn't know what to do with. And it fascinated me for a summer and has haunted me ever since, but then I went away. I didn't stay. I went back to law school. I went back to a career that then has led me here. Paul Farmer was there at the same time. He had arrived only a few years earlier before me. He arrived in the Central Plateau, and he started serving not just the poor, but the poorest of Haiti's poor and their medical needs there. When he was accepted to medical school a few years later, he actually stayed in Haiti and didn't really go to medical school. He brought his books to Haiti and, and just went back to take exams at Harvard. And around the same time, 1983 or five or so, uh, he met the young woman who uh, had become, after that, his uh, partner in founding Partners in Health in 1987, Ophelia Dahl. Ophelia was with us the last couple of days and, and told a really lovely uh, anecdote to us about her first encounter with Paul. She was in Haiti, and I gather feeling very much the way that I was at that time. What does one do with this? How can one be so moved and yet feel so helpless in the face of poverty like this? And she said that what Paul told her is, I can see a future here. I can see a way forward. I can see a way out. I can see an end that addresses this problem. Stay with me. Come with me, and we'll do this together. And so she did. And the rest is partners in health and that long story. But that answer, that answer that he gave her, tells everything, I think, that the accolades and the titles and the books don't tell about who Paul is. It tells us that uh, in, in an age when everything is ephemeral and temporary, including in the world of international development where the time frames are short and the results need to be immediate. Paul is a man of constancy, of fidelity. He's one who stays. In an era in which, as Pope Francis has only been the latest to warn us about, is dominated by technocracy, Paul is a man who allows himself to be dominated by humanity, by the encounter of and presence with and fidelity to human beings, above all. In a time when we are reduced in our relationships to instrumentalities and to results that can only be measured in statistical terms, Paul is, above all, a man of friendship. 
And that friendship is one that we've had the privilege at Notre Dame and at the Kellogg Institute to, be, to share in in these last few years. Uh, Paul, he's been here now several times for this ongoing project on accompaniment, the very topic that you'll be hearing about tonight, which has helped us to understand so much better the means and goals and methods of authentic development in the world. And he's enriched us with his ties to our community, his inspiration from Father Gustavo Gutierrez, who's here tonight in that friendship, his uh, participation in and spending time with us. Time is so precious. And uh, Paul understands that. And so we're very grateful to, to have you here with us this evening, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Yeah. Abrazo. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Paolo, you, you could just go on and on. I would listen to that all night. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to, this is a grand topic, um, and we've embraced it together, um, bringing people from all over um, here to Notre Dame several times, as you pointed out, and Steve Reifenberg and others uh, from the Institute and other parts of the university. Um, have helped us to do this. I, I, I do want, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus this grand topic on specificity. And, um, but I said that last time I was here and the time before. And so I have to cook up new things every time. Now, fortunately, the world is helping me cook up new and bad things. Uh, and, but then we get to cook up responses to them. Carolyn. Um, I, I want to start, though, by saying, um, Paolo, that uh, happily uh, the Haitians, you know, could envision something different. And, you know, in 1791 began their epic struggle uh, against slavery. Um, and, uh, and that was really inspiring for me, as I'm sure it was for you when you were there in the 80s. And uh, I, I'm just lucky that I got to stay. I still work with many of the same people who I met in 1983 and the years after. And some, some of my coworkers have, have died of old age, I'm happy to say. Um, unfortunately, a number of my other coworkers who were my age back then died in childbirth of cerebral malaria, um, of typhoid fever with a perforated ileum. And those experiences as a medical student going between, by the way, for those of you going to medical school, I did go to class sometimes, okay? <laughs> Paolo. Like, there are secrets. The insects in the swamp, another one. They were reptiles, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, going between Harvard and Haiti was, was a gift in and of itself. Um, I didn't feel any sense of entitlement to go to either Duke or, Haiti, or, or Harvard, or Haiti for that matter. And, it was just a really bracing uh, way to experience one's emergence into adulthood. And so I have this great debt. I'm quite sure that I would have said that the last time I was here as well. I underlined my debt to Haiti, which some people, Sarah Sieber among them, um, have been good enough to visit with us and help on very pragmatic efforts. I w I'm not going to talk about Haiti today, however. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to use an example from. Ebola. I had an epiphany um, on Tuesday night, which I shared. And since Paolo is fond of sharing my private confidences, I'm sure you'd have heard about it soon enough. So I'm just going to play out with it. Gustavo, forgive me. Um, Tuesday night, I was <clears throat> in, I had just gone to England. Um, and, you know, I was jet lagged, as one is especially going there. No offense to Ophelia, she's gone now. And um, I was, I've been just totally obsessed with Ebola and West Africa. Ebola just being a manifestation of what we'll talk about tonight, poverty. I'll make, try to make that uh, link clear. And I've been writing about it and thinking about it quite a bit. And uh, I woke up at some hour, I'm not, like two in the morning, 
And I thought, oh my God, I finally, I know how to get everybody involved in thinking about health system strengthening. Now that's a sexy topic, by the way, health system strengthening. I know, you're, Sarah's saying it's supposed to be, it's not. As soon as I started talking about health system strengthening, people nod off, all right? But I thought, I've got it. You know, how to make clear the link between vulnerability that is caused by and worsened by poverty and responses that could protect people from the slings and arrows out of, of outrageous fortune. You know, I was saying, talking, talking with Ophelia, that's one of the nice things, you know, after 35 years, still engaged in conversation. I said, it's like having a safety net slipped out from you as under you as you're falling. But I finally had it. I went, because everywhere I go and in the places I'm lucky enough to work, I meet people who really do care, you know. I don't meet the heartless bureaucrats. I, I meet bureaucrats, mind you, but they're not heartless. You know, I have had very limited experience with people who aren't, don't care. But it's finding a way to take those sentiments. Maybe they're sparked by pity or mercy. Um, taking those sentiments, which are fundamentally unstable, and linking them to long-term projects to reduce risk. And, uh, and I was a little bit tired of hearing that the way we do that is to focus on stories. Can we not think of something more original to say than that? So I worked it out. <laughs> it's like, and I, I bet you, I bet you, Father Gustavo doesn't even know what this is a picture of, right, Leo? This is a musical, Father Gustavo. It's on Broadway. It may open in Lima soon. Um, so. I said this at our company, I didn't have the guts to say it in England, by the way, I woke up and I wrote it down on a paper, you can't make this stuff up, and I went, the next morning I went, did I really think this was gonna change the world? But then I thought, maybe, you know, maybe it will. Um, maybe if we put a tune to it, I mean, you're telling me that Aaron Burr is more interesting than Ebola? It makes no sense whatsoever. So anyway, I'm gonna take a serious topic um, and try to sort through some of these things out loud. Uh, recent events, some of them meant very painful, actually. Um, but I want to just do a little background on uh, these pathogens. Um, because I've, I've said here that my grand title, which I sent off probably a month ago, Beth or Paolo or Steve, probably Steve, nagging me, sent us a talk title. So I came up with one, and I thought, why did I do that? And I have to talk about poverty and accompaniment. And, but of course, if you're an infectious disease physician or a nurse or a doctor or anyone working in close proximity to people living in poverty, you know very well the links between poverty and disease. The good news and the reason it's possible to see a future with a lot less of both is that these are amenable to interventions and show fairly rapid turnabout. I'll return to Haiti at the close of these remarks. But this particular set of pathogens, uh, um, the, the phyloviruses, the filoviridae, I'm sure you all know that already, um, are zoonoses. That is, they're animal pathogens that leap into humans. And, and these tend to be um, among the most virulent pathogens uh, that there are. Um, they're adapted to another host. They infect us. Um, they're often lethal. These are three. Marburg, which has an interesting name, right? Sounds like a German name, doesn't it? It is a German name, it's a German city. And the reason it's called Marburg is because without the diagnostic capacity to identify what it is that's killing you, um, there's no way to name it if it causes nonspecific symptoms. Some of you here will know the main symptoms of Marburg, like Ebola, fever, diarrhea, vomiting, and we'll, I want to return to that in a second. So why Marburg? Well, these were prime, non-human primate pathogens that ended up striking certain people in the city of Marburg, laboratory workers, because they're monkeys shipped by London, interestingly, to Marburg, Hamburg, and Belgrade, where there were laboratories. And a number of people died in these explosive, but limited epidemics, 
Uh, and the pathogen was identified because there were labs there and lab capacity with electron microscopes able to identify new pathogens. First came Marburg, then came Ebola. The third one there is HIV, by the way, another zoonosis, probably from the same part of the world, which became a global pandemic. And these two did not. The second one, Ebola, has a, uh, 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 another story that reveals transnational connections, of the sort Carolyn Nordstrom studies. Um, again, the pathogens strike um, people involved in caring for others. That was the story with Marburg as well. A number of the secondary cases were those who took care of those to first fall ill. Now with Ebola, what happened is a very sad story, um, from, uh, but worth remembering, because it's not different from what is going on now. Notice I didn't say has gone on recently. It's still going on now. And that was um, a group of nuns were working in a hospital in a very rural part of Zaire, the Congo. Now I say hospital, and I'll go back to that in a second. I'm just letting off air, don't worry. <laughs> um, so, uh, and the story uh, is probably something along these lines, it was worked out fairly well, is um, since the disease is transmitted by close contact with infected fluids, um, including vomit, diarrhea, et cetera. Uh, in this particular instance, um, the, the sisters, the nuns who were nursing, uh, constrained by a socialization for scarcity that we see all the time when we're talking about poor people, were reusing syringes. Not only from vaccination campaigns, but in prenatal clinic where you really don't need syringes because as the nurses here or clinicians could tell you, there's nothing you need to inject in a prenatal visit. And that's what amplified the epidemic, which exploded. And uh, because this was a former Belgian colony, some of this, uh, one of the researchers uh, or doctors sent to investigate, by the way, there weren't any doctors at this hospital, which had 100 beds, think about that. 100 bed hospital, mission hospital, no doctor. Sent samples off to the capital city, Kinshasa, and these ended up going to Antwerp, which is the home of a very famous tropical medicine institute. Some of you have probably studied there. Now there was a young infectious disease researcher there, a guy named Peter Piat, who some of you may know, and when he tells the story, I'm getting chills just thinking about it, they're sitting around goofily in their lab, and they're like, hey, look, a thermos from Kinshasa. Let's open it. And one of the test tubes in there was broken already. And fortunately, none of them fell ill. Um, but they realized they were onto something new, maybe a new pathogen. And this is, you know, in, in my world, infectious disease nerds, this is about the most exciting thing that can happen. Young Belgian, he's not familiar with, he's not seen scores of people die right in front of him. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore in Belgium. And he says to his boss, I really want to go to Zaire and investigate this myself. His boss, a grumpy virologist who will go unnamed. And then he was, they said, okay, you can go. And my favorite part of Peter Piat's story, and you should ask him when, you, when he comes here to talk, he, he didn't, he said his passport had expired because he had cut it out, and I quote, for some urgent need for a photograph to join a gym. <laughs> this is the great future international diplomat of head of UNAIDS, dean of the London School. Yeah, no passport because he cut the... People everywhere are human, don't forget it. He got there. <laughs> He got there without a passport, which is an interesting post-colonial trick I'd like to learn, <laughs> and went to investigate. And it was a very painful thing because he was working with more senior researchers in epidemiology and it didn't take them long to figure out this story, right? People from the CDC, the US CDC, from uh, elsewhere, the, uh, the French equivalent, the Pasteur Institute. And uh, <clears throat> he realized that he had to tell the nuns there what had happened, they were Flemish speakers. How many Flemish speakers do you guys know? Peter was Flemish, is Flemish. 
And he told this, had to talk to them about this. And that the, the reason that Ebola had spread and ripped through that hospital and killed these nuns and patients and others involved in the care, including a doctor sent to investigate, was because of poor infection control. And that's why it was ultimately limited in Marburg, in Hamburg, and Belgrade, just because gloves, they would have called barrier precautions, right? Gloves, a gown, the basics like that, that usually did it. So every single one of the documented <clears throat> Ebola outbreaks since then, and some people count this as the 25th, has been the same story. 1976, this was all sort of worked out. And this last year's, couple of years' tragedies uh, have been the result, again, of not having the staff, the stuff, the safe space, safe hospital, or the systems required to stop the epidemic. And that's, that's a painful thing to reflect on. So why, why did, why these three, in this huge epidemic by Ebola standards, why those three countries and no others? Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia. Well, again, this is not rocket science. Um, and it, it, it's not just saying we don't have health systems. You have to ask why. And um, by the way, accompaniment. Here's one I bet you haven't seen. I tried this one out on Gustavo before. So accompaniment requires things sometimes like laboratories. If the, if the disease presents, as I said it did, with fever, diarrhea, vomiting as the three cardinal symptoms, any infectious disease doctor could make a list with 50 different possible etiologies in that part of the world. I mean, in fact, we like doing it just to show off how long our list can be, <laughs> which is the equivalent in my age group of collecting insects in Florida. There's no way, thank you. You know, it's stressful to be up here, so laugh when I, and it's a painful story. You, you, need, you need more than goodwill to be an effective accompaniateur. Accompaniment is not just about being a, a nice person, uh, although it is also that. It's about having expert mercy linked to pragmatic solidarity. And this is something we discussed in our last sessions here a couple of years ago and with Gustavo. So this is a technical matter, <clears throat> but it's not enough to have a technocracy, as Paolo said. You, you need to link this kind of knowledge to an attempt uh, to do something about it. But that's part of accompaniment. Um, now, uh, the biggest epidemic prior to this uh, was in the town of Kikwi. Now, I know that you all read my best-selling book, Infections and Inequalities. <laughs> you know, I, on the way here, I was, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a research assistant sitting right here from Notre Dame. Yeah, she's pretty awesome, I must agree. Did her undergraduate training and her graduate training in the Global Health Program here. Some of you are currently students in it. Having already thought up Ebola the musical, I said, so Katie, this is when I landed in South Bend from Dublin, not a direct flight. <laughs> so Katie, so Katie, I says to her, I says, Look up another of my bestsellers, Women, Poverty, and AIDS, on Amazon and see its ranking. And compare it to how many people have seen Hamilton, the musical. Right? Now, I was hoping that it wouldn't be as bad as it really was. <laughs> Women, Poverty, and AIDS isn't even the top million bestsellers. That's hard. That's 600 pages of hard work. Hamilton, on the other hand, has, it, it, it's like a, my friend Abby or Tracy who are here could tell me, you can't get a ticket until next year. Is that true? All right, so I'm thinking we should have a line that long of people interested in Ebola. Seriously. I mean, it, it, we, the stories that we've seen and heard, the people we've met in the course of this fight have been no less inspiring 
than Hamilton or Burr. But we really haven't been able to capture, again, I don't know how you guys missed Infection and Inequalities. It's such a great book. <laughs> By the way, look at the cover a little harder. That's an Ebola mass grave. Although my, uh, my publisher at the University of California said, maybe having dead people on the cover is not a good marketing strategy. And, and I, I think she was right. <laughs> Why these three countries and no others? Because you know, Nigeria, and Sarah Sievers can, can talk to you about this, but Nigeria, Mali, all the neighboring countries were affected, as was the United States and several European countries. Um, and many with secondary cases, but not a lot. It was really stopped. Why? Well, these countries were uniquely vulnerable because of extraordinarily weak health systems um, that collapsed not only because of war, but also because of extract extractive industries that put little stock, evidently, in reinvesting in health and education. I mean, Liberia, and I, uh, one of my colleagues who's here looked at me doubtfully when I said this, so I looked it up last night. Liberia had one of the highest GDP, uh, for years and years on end, had one of the highest GDPs per capita in the world, at one point second only to Japan. This is in the 70s, right? So you can make a, a tidy fortune through extractive trades. That started 500 years ago by traffic in humans, but it has continued. I mean, Liberia, will return to this, but at one point the, uh, had the largest rubber plantations, not for local usage, as I'll show later. And Sierra Leone, as many of you know, uh, was the epicenter of the African, West African diamond trade, which is an international trade. In fact, the market is predominantly in the United States. So these two pictures, one is, and, I, and we work in both these places now, and, and I feel grateful to work, and I'll go back to we here as Partners in Health, which is, again, involves many partners, including a, some from Notre Dame, but largely from Harvard and its teaching hospitals. This is a pit mine near, uh, around a kimberlite pipe. That's where diamonds are formed and erupt out of the earth. Um, and these are allu alluvial diamonds, so then they're, they erupt out of the earth and then spread in rivers and waterways and can be panned. Um, you don't, the, these deep, deeper mines have been much later. The initial finds uh, were really in stream beds, and some of them have just been colossal diamonds, right? And it's only been more recently that these pits have been dug. This is in a town, near a town called Koidu, um, which I didn't know. Um, its name before I first went to Sierra Leone in June of 2014. Now, for the undergraduates here, and can I ask how many undergraduates here? Oh, well, aren't you glad I made the differential diagnosis list for you? <laughs> Listeriosis. I'll quiz you right afterwards. You can tell me what that is. Here's another story that I wouldn't have told in my first 10 years after graduating. I already knew because I took a medical anthropology course at Duke University. I did tell this story, but now I'll tell you the full version. At Duke University, uh, maybe my sophomore or junior year, I took a class called Medical Anthropology, and, and it very much changed my life. I knew I wanted to be a doctor, although fortunately, even by the time of my medical school interviews, no one thought to ask me why, because I wouldn't have known. And I never ask applicants that question, by the way. It's okay not to know and to grow into your reasons, as far as I'm concerned. But I knew I wanted to be a doctor, and after that I knew I wanted to be a doctor in West Africa. Now, go figure, why? I'd never been there. I'd barely been out of Florida. Um, and, uh, and I applied for a Fulbright. And I thought, well, you know, I'm gonna get it. I'm so smart, I'm so handsome, <laughs> talented, good at friendship, respectful. <laughs> and I want you undergraduates to take heart because I didn't even get an interview. So Haiti was plan B, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I'll return to that in a minute. But I knew I wanted to go there, and, and I, I couldn't say why. And uh, I didn't get there until June of 2014. And by that time, of course, having wanted to go there for 30 years, I had made a point of, of learning about the place over the course of the years. One of my 
classmates from college is sitting right there, and she can tell you this is all true. Is it not? So uh, the other place, <laughs> the other place is Harper, Liberia. And both of these places were devastated by war, and a lot of it was fueled by the diamond trade. But this picture from Harper is not taken uh, 15 years ago. I took this two months ago. Harper still looks like, you know, it looks like the war ended not too long ago. The reason I bring that up, and I was asking one of my colleagues here who knows a lot about this, um, about what happened after the end of the war. Now, how do you end a war that ended up involving up to 60,000 combatants? I said a war because the two wars were not just coterminous in time, but linked to each other, right? Started in Liberia, then Sierra Leone, and these spread east, spread west rather from the rainforest, right? West all the way to the coast, the wars did. So did the epidemics. And, um, and of course, we knew people standing in the way of the epidemics, and I'll return to that. But these wars uh, were not local affairs. Uh, they were, in a way, global conflicts that involved tens of thousands of combatants. And you know some of the most grisly parts of the story, right? <coughs> Amputation campaigns, and there's a a similarity in, in, uh, across those borders because it really involved a lot of the same actors. Uh, and they were a dizzying array of factions that were almost impossible for an outsider to decipher. The third country, Guinea, you could say, well, Guinea didn't have a civil war that went on for 10, 15, almost 20 years in the case of Liberia. But in a way, it did because at one point, a quarter of all Sierra Leoneans were refugees in Guinea. So these three countries have gone through not only 450 years of extractive trades and then colonial regimes. You could say, wait, well, Liberia wasn't a colony. Some people have said it's a pseudo-colony of the United States. It was colonized by Am Americans. And, uh, and it's a very complicated story, and I don't want to reduce any of, the, any of this, including the, the noble parts of it. Liberia and Haiti were the two oldest independent re black republics in the world. And, um, and even Sierra Leone was named Freetown, the, the capital was named Freetown for a reason. It was part of the province of freedom. But the, the real story is, is one of continued extraction and then colonial rule and then after independence, ongoing extractive trades and finally civil war. Now if you were to make a list like the one I did of infectious pathogens that could cause those symptoms, you'd have a pretty long list of pathogenic forces that could render those countries uniquely vulnerable to a zoonosis from animals that was spread through person-to-person -person contact. And I remember, finally, we're headed to Sierra Leone in June of 2014. And that also involves Notre Dame, because I was going with a group of surgeons um, by the way, hanging around with large groups of surgeons is very interesting anthropologically. But the lead on this effort was a, is a Notre Dame graduate named John Mira. I keep telling Father Jenkins that you guys should give him an honorary degree. Now I'm saying it in front of everybody. <laughs> Great guy. So we trained together at Harvard. He in surgery and I in infectious disease and we're friends from 25 years ago. And, uh, and, our, and he went off to Australia and then came back to Harvard, where he's the chief plastic surgeon at Children's Hospital. And uh, we've been working together on health of poor people. And you may think, well, how does that work out? Well, poor people have surgical disease, too, not just malaria, tuberculosis, aid, and obstructed labor. A classic killer of women living in poverty is surgical disease very often. So we had been planning this effort, which was organized with the help of a British medical journal called The Lancet. Now, The Lancet, I know you read that every week, the undergraduates, never miss it, right? I, actually, I'm, I'm supposed to say, I know you read New England Journal of Medicine every week. It's a Harvard publication. But The Lancet Commission on Surgical Care for the, let's say, the bottom billion, a much larger number, we were going to have three meetings. 
The first we launched at Harvard. The third was in Dubai, for reasons I won't go into. But we said, we got to have at least one of these meetings in a place that lacks the staff, stuff, space, and systems um, to deliver safe surgical care without economic catastrophe, which is the fate of most people who actually live in poverty and do get surgery. If they're lucky, they get saved, but they also get ruined financially. And uh, so this is a very complex topic as well. And it had taken a while to set up this meeting in Freetown through the help of a, a group of British surgeons who'd been working there since after the war ended in 2002. Well, the meeting was scheduled for June 2014, and this epidemic, according to the origin narratives that many of us believe, but it's okay if we're wrong, we'll figure it out, started in December of 2013 in rural Guinea, in a little village called Meliandu. A little boy, maybe two years old, named Emil, falls ill. Again, nonspecific symptoms, fever, diarrhea. Um, his mother takes him to a healthcare provider in a nearby city, um, and he dies. And then she dies, and then the grandmother dies, and the sister dies. This may have gone unnoticed if it didn't start picking off nurses and then doctors. And then, in March or, uh, of 2014, it became clear that this was Ebola, and it was very unlikely to be stopped in crossing that porous border between Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. If you look at a map, and now I wish I'd put one up, those three countries come together in a narrow little firth of land in what was a rainforest, still partly covered by rainforest, especially in Liberia. And uh, there's no you know, border patrol there. Um, these people have been trading together or fleeing raids and other illicit trades for, as I said, hundreds of years. And since I had helped to organize the conference and in fact had raised the money, uh, part of the money for the conference, bringing 100 surgeons together is very difficult under the best of circumstances. Uh, but this was not the best of circumstances. I started getting emails saying, we, we have to move the meeting from Freetown, Sierra Leone, to somewhere else. It's not a safe venue. Now, here's where I got to pull my uh, non-accompanying tour weight and say, I thought, wait, I helped raise the money. I'm going to get to say. So I said, no, we're not moving the conference. You don't get Ebola by attending medical conferences. And, there we, and we met there. I only knew three Sierra Leoneans. <laughs> None of the surgeons canceled. They're not the scared types, but I only knew three Sierra Leoneans at the time, June 2014. All of them were doctors. Here they are. An infectious disease doctor colleague named Humar Khan, who interestingly and perhaps tragically was a specialist in guess what? hemorrhagic fevers. Lassa was his specialty, and he'd worked on this for 10 years, and was very connected to American academic medicine, Tulane, Harvard, also the NIH, our National Institutes for Health, the CDC, the World Health. It was a very plugged in physician who worked in Kenema, halfway between the forest and the coast. The one in the middle, Martin Salia, one of the few surgeons left in Sierra Leone um, had been in the surgical conference, the Lancet Surgical Conference, um, and participated in our robust discussions, which, by the way, focused on what Father Gustavo would call a preferential option for the poor. That's not the language that surgeons use, but that was the concern. You know, how do we provide this kind of care for people living in poverty? <laughs> And the third, Dr. Byler Berry was a student of mine, is a student of mine, um, and uh, he had almost a decade ago reached out to me uh, when he and an American then medical student named Dan Kelly founded a, an NGO which was based near that town with the mines, Koidu, uh, uh, called Well Body Alliance, which is again like Partners in Health was when we started it in Haiti 
all those years ago with our Haitian colleagues. Three Sierra Leoneans, three doctors. By November 2014, two were dead of Ebola. Humar Khan, the man who identified the epidemic as due to Ebola, knew exactly what was coming um, because it, he said to the nurses there, brace yourselves because it starts with a funeral um, or some uh, and caregiving and uh, it will invade this hospital and our campus and it did. And uh, it was it, you know, in some ways um, in between June, I, I, I left um, on the last morning that we were there um, after our spirit, spirited debates, um, my English friends and who were um, with Martin Salia, the surgeon, said, well, we'd really like you to come and visit the Ebola treatment unit that we've set up in the main referral hospital. I mean, what was I going to say? No, I'm busy. You know, um, first of all, the question was, had Ebola already hit Freetown on that day? It had. Um, but it wasn't acknowledged as having invaded the city. I went to the hospital, and I met I met with my English colleagues and a, a young Spanish infectious disease doctor named Marta and nurses uh, and they had set up the Ebola treatment unit right across from the what they called the casualty bay, the emergency room. And I left thinking they are sitting ducks and they were and so was Humar Khan. Now, between June, when we left, and when we returned first to Liberia in, in uh, late August, and eventually uh, returned, I mean, it didn't matter if I were to return myself. What, what can you do without staff stuff spaces? If you need partners in health, or you need your partners in health to go. Between June and September, those were the longest months of many years to me, because we knew we should be there. Um, and it's not that we had any special expertise in responding to these particular kinds of outbreaks, just that we knew we should have been in this most medically impoverished part of the world a long time ago. But you have to, it takes time and also suasion to bring your team along. And uh, the Board of Partners in Health said, you can go, and we left the next day, a group of us. And, uh, and began this work. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But one of the other difficult things, in addition to waiting, was hearing the discussion about why people like Kumar Khan and then Martin Salia were, and, and many, many more nurses, uh, were dying of Ebola, why anybody was dying of Ebola. And the most common things that we heard in those months, and it got even worse towards November, was discussions like about exotic funerary ritual. So I'm glad someone chuckled because why don't you just say funerals? But no, it sounds better to say exotic funerary ritual or mortuary ritual, right out of anthropology books, but totally misapplied in this case. They didn't have, people who don't have the staff stuff, space or systems to bury the dead safely are going to face problems like this from many pathogens and used to, right? And who takes care of the sick? Families and some few professional caregivers, mostly nurses and some remaining doctors, but families are the mainstay. So here's the professionals. The other thing we heard so much about was bush meat, which again sounds much cooler than game. You know, people eat meat. If God wanted us to be vegetarians, he wouldn't have made them taste so good. <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, th these, these were, I, I, I get asked this question all the time, but, so just strike that, it was just humor. You know, th these are not the reasons that this pathogen was taking out West Africa's medical professionals. Um, it's because they actually stood their ground but without the accompaniment that they needed. Because that accompaniment needs things like staff, stuff, 
space systems. I'll go over those in, in a minute. Now, what about the non-professionals? By the way, at the, when the dust settled, um, Humar Khan, who died on, uh, in, I think, July 29th, when the dust settled on that district of Kenema, 15% of all the people who died in that district were healthcare professionals, 15%. And 15% of the population in Kenema are not healthcare professionals. So there's extraordinarily high risk of getting Ebola and dying of it if you stood your ground as a healthcare professional, which is why some of us have taken so much umbrage at hearing the nature of their risk reduced to exotic funerary practices or munching on bushmeat. I mean, it's not like there were suddenly 30,000 cases of epidemic bushmeat hunger. This is human to human transmission. Now, what about the family members? Well, here's three young people I met. And I'm going to talk about the young man also whose picture is on the, was the first one, his name's Ibrahim. But these three, um, this is a young woman named um, Hawanatu. This guy we always called the chairman. Um, his real name's Muhammad, but we always call him the chairman. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, you know, when I was in the Ebola treatment unit, I was always trying to organize the patients. I said, really? Good for you. So I'll call him the chairman, too. And her name is escaping me for a minute. It'll come back, senior moment. But these three, like so many others, they're all linked one to the other. And the story was not too dissimilar. They, die, they didn't die. They got sick because they were caregivers, just like Dr. Khan. And, uh, and, and Dr. Salia. And that is, they were the caregivers, the only caregivers their family had very often. The young woman, her father, her grandfather actually was a traditional healer, right? Traditional healer is another way kind of, of throwing us off um, the track of the real problem. When you don't have healthcare professionals, and again, this is a medically impoverished part of the world, probably the most outside of Afghanistan and parts of Pakistan, if you don't have you know, doctors and nurses, of course you're going to go see somebody else who's a healer. Her grandfather was a traditional healer. He was the first to get sick, I believe. And his son, her father, went to take care of him, his father. The grandfather died, then his wife. And then the son came back to Freetown, and he fell ill. His daughter, of course, took care of him. Her boyfriend and the father of her baby helped her best friend helped. Her father uh, died. He helped bury the father. They had a one-year-old child. She fell sick. He fell sick. The baby fell sick. Fell sick, and then their friend. And this went on and on in these concentric circles of caregiving without proper accompaniment, not caregiving in an ignorant fashion, not bushmeat eating. You know, and, and the signs, by the way, that say don't eat bush meat are still up. Your tax dollars probably paid for most of them, right? And you know, some are saying, well, you, we should take down those signs and say these people does need and deserve accompaniment to care for the sick and to bury the dead. You don't have to be Dan Grudy or Father Gustavo to think that, you know, caring for the sick, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and burying, isn't that the other corporal work of mercy? I never thought I'd be saying that standing here at Notre Dame, the corporal works of mercy, but I did the last time I was here, too. Thumbs up from the noted theologian of Notre Dame. <laughs> corporal works of mercy, Gustavo. So you kind of have to, you kind of have to have a little humor to get through this. This is a devastating, devastating. You, there are people who would say, well, there's a lot more malaria. True. You also need staff stuff, space, and systems to deal with that. A lot more AIDS, true, staff stuff, space, and systems. And these are matters that I talked about on previous visits here. So what do we mean exactly? Well, this is the kind of, this, this, I, t I saved this picture from the New York Times because we, we have you know, plenty of photographs like this. This is an Ebola treatment unit without the T in it, right? What kind of treatment can happen there? Um, people being put into a holding unit with no, not even adequate food and water, 
of course they're going to perish. And the legacy of a disease control only approach to epidemic disease had begun in the late 19th century, especially in the British colony, Sierra Leone, and in the French colony, Guinea. And it wasn't much better, it certainly wasn't any more effective, but it wasn't much better in terms of other goals in Liberia either, although there were probably less corporal, restrictive, quarantine-focused measures. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about everything from even malaria. I mean, the British spent years arguing that we should just segregate the city. Black, white. Like, the mosquitoes don't care, <laughs> right? And they, it's not just malaria they transmit. It makes no sense whatsoever to think that segregating the city and moving the British up into a hill station uh, is going to stop malaria. And that's exactly what happened. And they, they tried it also in South Africa and India um, and perhaps other places as well. The plague, which would later hit the French colony, particularly, particularly Senegal, same story, you know, spread by rats. Uh, and again, isolation, quarantine, putting people with the disease into these lazarettos where they were like this um, didn't stop the plague. What stopped it was DDT, which the Americans brought in with World War II. Influenza, same story. Sleeping sickness, actually sleeping sickness, American trypanosomiasis. You know, a friend of mine who uh, works here talks about the neglected tropical diseases. If they're poor people's diseases, they're all neglected. And this control-only paradigm is really the one that we advanced officially as the world to stop Ebola. The focus was on isolation, containment, quarantine, case finding, and removing infected individuals from the population. Now, you could argue, well, it worked before. And that's OK. I wouldn't want to be on the other side of that quarantine, mind you. Uh, but it did work before. These were kept in small, isolated rural villages. But after it starts hitting cities, you know, you can say all you want, but if you don't, aren't able to draw people into care, um, and this is not care, because, you know, you don't have to be a nurse or a doctor to know that um, if the main symptoms are diarrhea and vomiting, do we know how to treat diarrhea and vomiting? Of course we do. We've known how to treat hypotension. Even Sarah, who's not a medical doctor, although her sister is, is going like this. That's right. It's called replacement therapy. Now, if you're lucky and you're dehydrated after your, one of your 15-mile runs around the lakes here, or whatever it is you guys do, <laughs> then you could drink Gatorade, right? But what if you're vomiting? Try drinking Gatorade when you're vomiting or the equivalent oral re any oral rehydration solution. But the treatment is fairly straightforward, but it requires uh, rehydration, replacement of what? Fluids and electrolytes, not rocket science. We've known about this since World War I. That's really when replacement therapy was identified, um, and, uh, and it's been refined. Uh, at, at Harvard Medical School, you can't move 15 feet without seeing the Walter B. Cannon conference room or the Walter B. Cannon amphitheater. That was he, late 19th century is when he started at Harvard Medical School. And he worked on this, the treatment of shock. That's what this is, hypovolemic shock. So this was a big problem. A, dis a disease control only paradigm that did not have caregiving at the middle of it was one of the main reasons that people stayed at home. It's not because they were superstitious or wanted to go off and feast on bushmeat while they were puking. It's because they knew they would receive facilities like this, and they were right. So turning that around rather than just diagnosing it as a problem, what's the accompaniment that's required for that? I already said the really arcane formula. You guys can stop and write this down. I'll go slow, staff, stuff, space, systems. So staff. By the way, this is uh, one of the, our patients who became a good friend of mine and a caregiver, actually. His name's Ibrahim, 27 years old. I met him 
I said one of our patients, I was actually not involved in his care acutely. I met him in a meeting with other survivors. And it was this, I'll never forget the night. I'm amusing myself right now, which is a good thing. When I think about this, I get so uh, choked up that I either have to amuse myself or you know, think with such great sorrow about all the young lives squandered. The night I met him, we were having a survivors group meeting at of all, uh, where one would normally have a survivors group meeting in Freetown, the Radisson Blue. <laughs> Remember, I was organizing the dinner and someone said, you can't invite Ebola survivors into the Radisson Hotel. I said, oh yeah, watch, stand by and watch. <laughs> Nobody said a word to me. So we're having this big giant party. This is November and the chairman who as described in my initial interactions with a rather lively guy. Um, and, and none of these, and lot, most of these people don't drink alcohol at all. We're drinking wine and enjoying ourselves. And they're drinking some awful thing called Malta. You know, I inspected the bottle being Irish. It's funny. And no alcohol in it. And so they stood up to give a toast, the chairman and another guy, Ibrahim. And uh, they said, we don't want to be known as Ebola survivors. We're Ebola conquerors. The place went wild. It's a restaurant of the Radisson Hotel. Uh, and the other people, there were tons of people. There are no tourists, I might add, but everyone from the WHO, CDC, the USAID, they're looking and saying, God, these guys know how to have a fun time. They came and joined our party instead of telling us we couldn't have Ebola gatherings in the Radisson. Anyway. You need all kinds of people to do this work. But particularly, and Ibrahim was begging to be involved in the response. But I said, well, you know, let's talk first. I mean, so he sat next to me that night. He told me, and I'll never forget this either. And I thought, mistakenly, they were sort of brash and outspoken because of this toast. And the chairman himself is brash and outspoken. But that didn't turn to be a correct diagnosis on first blush. But he told me that night that he'd lost 22 members of his family to Ebola, all in one month of hell. And I didn't know what to say. It's like, how do you lose an in war, genocide? But most infectious pathogens don't do that, right? And, and I thought, he may be asking to join us in caregiving, but we're not going to let him anywhere near an ETU. You know, I wouldn't, you know, he's had enough of that to last 10 lifetimes. So it was really a long time before he got involved in caregiving, not in, in uh, caregiving of people with active and infectious Ebola, but helping people like this girl, Mariatu. And I, I would credit Ibrahim with saving her life because she had barely survived. Um, I don't know if you met her, Marie, but. She, oh wait, that's, sorry, that's Yaboma. I'll go back to Mariato in a second. Yaboma is another one who lost most of her family. Uh, and uh, there, there are stories which I, <clears throat> took me a long time together, moved me very greatly. I just knew, and we all knew, that you couldn't just have, as the staff for these projects, public health authorities interested in surveillance and control. You needed clinicians who could provide care for sick people. And if for no other reason, which again is not the reason that we would espouse, you would certainly need them to draw people towards the health system rather than to repulse them from it. I would have fled had I been someone afraid of seeing a kind of Ebola treatment unit like the one I showed you, and they were everywhere. So that's what we worked on, and, uh, and the staff you know, a, a number of people said, well, you're not going to get American doctors and nurses to go and work in, in Sierra Leone or, or Liberia. Um, within 10 days of announcing that we were looking for experienced clinicians who were nurses, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, and doctors with a few skills other than blabbing, we had 1,500 people sign up, including Marie Donahue right over there, um, who showed up early on and was with us for seven weeks. And I'll go back to that in a second. But you also needed, 
you know, this is another problem with accompaniment or a challenge of accompaniment. You don't know, you know when it's going to start. I told you when it started for us. You don't know what, when it's going to end. That's the magic of accompaniment. Some of my colleagues gathered here, again, we're talking about that today. But, you know, at the Harvard Hospital where I work at the Brigham, when my friends like John Mira, the surgeons, the surgeons are complaining about their schedules or something they can't find, I always say to them, at least you don't have to build your own operating rooms and put in the electricity and sewage and water. That usually shuts them up for a little bit. <laughs> so you need staff. You need stuff, and you know, it's, I feel kind of cheap using this example, but you know, for Liberia to be the site of the largest and a US-owned Firestone um, company, 1926, we had trouble getting gloves. And it wasn't just our colleagues who really had trouble getting gloves before the Americans got there. It's still difficult to get the stuff we needed. Not just gloves, gowns, what's called personal protective equipment, and also, rapid diagnostics, IV fluids. There's a long list, but it's not a complicated list. It was difficult, really almost all the way through. And space. And I wanna, I wanna say a word about Port Loco. I'm sure you're all familiar with Port Loco. You know, I went, on October 9th, we met with the Minister of Health. Ophelia Dahl was there. Corrado Concheta, an infectious disease doctor from Partners in Health. Um, Byler Berry. Um, Martin Sally was still alive, but he was working already in the city, you know, knowing that it was very difficult for him to do surgical care, but trying his best. So we met with the Minister of Health of Sierra Leone, and, uh, and we said, we're going to go to Koidu, to Kano District in the east, where those giant pits were and where a well body alliance had been working. And um, he was new, new Minister of Health. <clears throat> his predecessor had been maybe not fired, but something along those lines, in part because of the disaster that had unfolded, including the loss of Humar Khan, um, which was a national and international incident, by the way. You can read about it. It's very upsetting for his friends to think back. But we met with him. His name Dr. Fofana. And he's, we said, we're going to go to Koidu. And I'm, what were we looking for? Applause? You know? The ministers of health were tired, and the ministries of health were tired. They are the ones who had been there from the beginning and lacked the staff, staff space, and systems. And he said, it's too late. And we didn't say anything. He said, it's too late. You should go here to Port Loco, where the disease is cresting now. There are hundreds of people falling sick every week and you need to come here and in Freetown, which is where Marie ended up as well. So we said, okay, we'll go to Port Loco. And on the way out the door, I said to Byler Berry, where's Port Loco? He said, well, it's not too far from here. And, uh, and that night, back in the Radisson Hotel, I looked in my books, I, I travel with books, better than insects. And Port Loco is everywhere. In any book about Sierra Leone, any history book about it's a, it, was a slaving way station. Uh, it has a Portuguese name because they were the masters of the high seas and the slave trade along with the Spanish back then. And it's been settled for all those years. And let's just say that I wasn't expecting you know, uh, a nice facility uh, and then I went to Liberia and got a call from my coworkers there, including the infectious disease doctor I mentioned, and he said, We're, we just went to Port Loco. It's not a clinic. It's an abandoned vocational school. There are dead people everywhere. I said, well, who would abandon a vocational school? I mean, you have to be pretty lousy to get abandoned as an infrastructure in Sierra Leone. Right? And it was as lousy as described. Right? There, that's a picture of it. <clears throat> and so the choice couldn't be up to me. I couldn't say to my coworkers, you will go in there. I couldn't say to Marie, you will go. Forget that you haven't delivered a baby in 20 years. You will go deliver babies. 
Nobody else would do it. I couldn't really say that to her. It had to be people's own volition. It's dangerous posting. And to go into these places, particularly Port Loco, an abandoned facility where there are dead people everywhere and dying people as well, that was a choice that had to be made by the team and the clinicians. And I know what I wanted them to do, and that's what they did. I wish that they would understand that building a new and safer space would take time that those people did not have, whether in Freetown or Monrovia or Port Loco. And that's what they did. And I'm very proud of them, my coworkers, you know, for, for making that choice to go to where people were already dying and where their Sierra Leonean Liberian colleagues were also going, trying to help. On the day that we started in Port Loco, two more nursing assistants fell ill. Um, and in the government hospital nearby, it wasn't any better. It didn't look as bad, but there was just as much death. I'm proud to tell you, I'm proud of my colleagues, at Sierra Leonean, Cuban. Of course, the Cubans always show up. They always show up. They have a ministry of showing up, as my friend Jenny Block would say. There was the Americans, a couple French people. You've got to have them for spice. <laughs> the Cubans, Sierra Leoneans. And of course, because we're partners in health, Haitians. In fact, the team lead in Liberia for the first year was a Haitian. My colleagues, former students. And 8% uh, of all survivors in Sierra Leone walked or were carried out of this facility. Do you like your picture? So, you know, the, um, Ophelia Dahl's up there too. She, she had to leave earlier, but there was a logic to the way we got scattered, and a lot of it has to do with the ministries of health and connections that we had already. Um, the rural connection for us is always so what Partners in Health does, goes where there isn't staff, staff space and system, and tries to put it in place. It's not easy to do, it takes time. You never get it anywhere near good enough. It never is anything close to the kind of quality that we get thanks for. We don't deserve that, but we try, and we're gonna keep trying. That's how we ended up in Maryland. That picture that I showed you, and there may, I, I think we have a couple of people here tonight who are from Liberia. The picture that I showed you that looked like the war just ended, that's down there in Maryland, which is named after the state of Maryland because it was settled by American former slaves, free people of color, and recaptives, as were all the coastal settlements with American-sounding names, because they are American names, right? And this relationship between the United States and Liberia stretches back to the early part of the 19th century. That's why we ended up in the East, near the origins of this, and I gotta say, again, going to Liberia, to southeastern Liberia, my friend Tracy, who's got this totally hipster picture up there, the only one I could find of you, my dear, sorry. She was already working with this NGO, Last Mile Health, working, which was working in these rural areas, largely with community health workers. But again, accompaniment meant not just accompanying community health workers, it meant accompanying people trying to organize the public health response away from only control, disease control, but including disease control, surveillance, and reporting, and integrating that with care. So Tracy, who found herself in the Ministry of Health in somebody's office, was stuck there for two and a half years. And she's here tonight. And like Marie, they both deserve a little applause, if I may. Now, what was the goal? Um, Steve Reifenberg is on the board, and he will remember of Partners in Health and knows that this was, from the outset, designed by us to, in a way, to use the excuse of Ebola to go in and build health systems that would endure over time. That didn't happen after the war. That's why I'm talking about Ebola the musical. It might not sound sexy to talk about health system strengthening, but it's what matters. It's, what, it's why my Haitian colleagues, like Anani, came to West Africa. Max Raymond, who drowned in Sierra Leone two months ago, you know, from, came all the way from Haiti. 
you know, to serve in building up health system. That's what we're all about, and that's what we need to do now. And that requires accompaniment, not just our accompaniment of our colleagues in Sierra Leone and Liberia, but your accompaniment of us. Because this is not short-term work that's going to happen in the course of a year or two or three. It never has in any case in any of the places I've been. Just to give you an idea of how critical this is, I just want to close with, I think these are the only graphs I've used, right? Um, Sierra Leone already had the highest maternal mortality uh, in the world, probably. And that was before Ebola. Liberia, again, my colleagues, Jacob and Tracy, can tell you it's a grim situation. There were advances in that decade of peace, but most of the financing was not channeled through the Ministry of Health or other Liberian or Sierra Leonean institutions, but through international NGOs, which may or may not have been interested in health system strengthening. Usually in emergencies, that's not what happened. This is before Ebola, and it's only gotten worse. And you can look, when Ebola is brought under control, expect that you'll be hearing of its recurrence. It persists in the human body. But you'll be hearing about measles, pertussis, outbreaks of pathogens that really haven't been seen. Yellow, yellow fever just cropped up again in Angola. That's, that's what we should be worried about. And non-communicable diseases like this. What sent us to Sierra Leone in the first place was surgical disease. The leading killer of young adults in both of these countries, and probably all three, is often trauma. And not just during the war, during peacetime as well. So this is health system strengthening work, uh, and it's going to take a long time. Now, does this often happen in emergencies? Uh, in my experience, almost never. Um, there are these three things that don't happen that should be linking these emergency responses, born often of goodwill attention that is all too short-lived. The last time I was here, I was talking about Haiti after the earthquake. And again, predicting that this would happen, it did, and there's no vindication in correctly predicting our attention deficit disorder in humanitarian work and development. But surely there has to be progress. We have to get better at saying we have to think about building local capacity, aka training. We have to think about health system strengthening, no matter how unsexy it may sound compared to Hamilton or a bowl of the music. And we have to generate new knowledge. Why do we, why do, what do you mean research? By the way, please note that teaching, health system strengthening, and research, those are central to the core of at least academic medicine, and two of them are central to universities in general. Why research? Well, do we have a field trial proven rapid diagnostic? We didn't until the epidemic, and some people said, again, some of my colleagues were among them, we better find out if we can diagnose this more quickly. Do we have a vaccine? We didn't before the epidemic. But some people said, we really have to try and test this vaccine. And it worked, by the way. We don't know how well it worked yet, but at least the trial got done. Research is on this list. Never happens. And it gets dismissed as not urgent enough. And nothing is more urgent than building a health system able to prevent people from falling so ill or dying unattended in the first place. Rwanda, and some of you will recognize the Minister of Health of Rwanda at the top. Um, Rwanda has really fought hard to put these three activities front and center. They fought hard after the genocide, and they're still fighting hard. And this is the kind of effort that really deserves support from here, whether you're in the public sector or not. And Notre Dame, last I checked, is not a public university, and neither is Harvard. Partners in Health is not a public institution. But that doesn't mean we can't help move forward this shared agenda of global health equity. That is, safety nets that include, if you're hit by a car, as I was, by the way, as a med student, and I'll close with this. I was a Harvard medical student and got hit by a car in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I would have been very unhappy if the EMTs had walked over to me, leaned over and said, should have looked both ways before you cross the street. 
But that's what control without care is. Like, you shouldn't have gotten Ebola. You shouldn't have gotten pregnant. You shouldn't have gotten AIDS. And on and on the list goes. Like, preventing disease works only so much. I have news for you, and I'm not a theologian. You're all going to die at some point. We need to have compassionate, merciful, just healthcare systems. And that's part of accompaniment. Um, I, I, uh, I, when I uh, was here, not last time, but the time before, you know, I remember showing this image. And uh, after the earthquake in Haiti, which, by the way, was a very difficult time for us, for me personally, too, to be honest. Um, and this was one of the first talks I gave after the earthquake was here. And uh, I remember saying, well, we're, we're, we know that these are the things that don't happen in an emergency. But we're going to try and, and do it in Haiti. Do what? Build a university medical center. Right? And again, we got the same lectures from development specialists, public health authorities, not Haitians, saying, well, you know, this isn't really a priority in the middle of an emergency. Uh, and I, we could have argued, uh, and I, I'll say to the undergraduates here, spend less than 84.2%, no, spend less than 12.4% of your time arguing. Better to spend the rest of it doing things that you care about and know to be right. So we could have argued, well, you know, the teaching system for Haitian doctors and nurses just collapsed last week. Physically, literally. The nursing school collapsed completely. The third year collapsed. It was 4.57 in the afternoon. You can imagine what happened to the nursing students and their faculty and the med students and dental students and pharmacy students and hospital workers in those parts of the hospitals that were destroyed or damaged. Leo Gan, as many of you know here, was the epicenter. And it went north right into Port-au-Prince. It's pretty populated all the way along that strip. Now, fortunately, people like you had armed us to not argue. We actually had the money, unsolicited donations from across the world, but particularly from the United States. And so we said, well, we're going to build an academic medical center in central Haiti out of the earthquake zone. And we'll call it University Hospital. Some people said, well, you can't call it University Hospital. There's no university there. And we said, yet. There will be. Anyway, so this was the image that I showed you, but this is not a model or a mock-up. That's, that's an aerial photograph, and that was two years ago. So we're pretty excited, pretty excited. Is a hospital going to solve Haiti's development problems? We didn't say that. Is a hospital going to solve Haiti's health problems? We didn't say that either. And my colleague, Evan Lyon, is looking for him because he has worked in Haiti for 20 years. We never said any of those things. We said these are necessary for our species to survive when we do get hit by a car, when we do get Ebola, when we do have obstructed labor, when we do have acute pneumonia. And be very suspicious, I'm saying this to the students, when you hear from experts um, that certain things that are central to our survival as, as humans are not cost effective, not sustainable, not priorities. Be suspicious, just extend a hermeneutic of it suspicion, and you, you weigh the evidence yourself. If the burden of disease includes serious illness and injury, cancer, say, complications of diabetes, um, <coughs> Ebola, loss of fever, cerebral malaria. I told you about my three friends I lost. I didn't go into detail. Obstructed labor or peripheral sepsis, it's called. These are people in their 20s, my age back then, cerebral malaria. Typhoid with a perforated helium. Each of them could have been saved even after they were critically ill by a facility like this. And again, it's not going to solve all the problems, but it's going to solve some of them and allow a generation of Haitian nurses, doctors, managers, pharmacists, researchers to be trained and to engage in work as they did in West Africa or the United States or elsewhere. This is a Probably the, certainly the only war I can think of that's really worth fighting. And the, now here I am going to do the same thing. I'm going to say there isn't really 
a proper hospital in southeastern Liberia. Um, how do I know that? Because that's where the Ministry of Health sent us and said, you should go there. We went there, there's one doctor in all of that vast area, which by the way, really was covered a lot of it, is covered a lot of it by jungle, one. And I, when I met her, I thought, how could you possibly do this for years on end with no staff, stuff, space, or systems? And, I, and the answer is, you can't. So we will build a new hospital there as we're strengthening health systems, as we're supporting Liberian community health workers with our partners like Last Mile Health. And we will help train the next generation of Liberian nurses, doctors, and health managers. And the great thing about a prediction like this is that I know I'm going to be right. Is that, is that immodest, Father Dan? Because it's, it, if you apply the resources and passion and accompaniment model to problems like this, they're eminently soluble. Um, anyway, I've said it publicly. Um, and I, if, I, if we fail, then I'll never come back to Notre Dame. <laughs> Thank you all very much. I went over. Uh, well, we, we've we've kept you uh, late already, but it's been such a, a fascinating uh, narrative, Sorry. Paul. Thank you. No, no, no apologies needed. I'm apologizing to the students because there's uh, little time for questions, but we will take a little bit of time for questions. Um, maybe we'll take three questions uh, all up front and then you can answer them together. And I'd really like them to come from students. So if you have questions. And we're going to meet afterwards. Yeah, yes, and then there'll be a reception afterwards, but I'll, I'll announce that after the questions. Uh, and anyone? Right here. Uh, first of all, Dr. Farmer, thank you so much for being here. I'm right here. Oh, hi there. Hi. Um, my question for you is how do you balance being... Is that Glenna? I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, what's your name? Oh. My name's Lexi. Lexi. All right. Hi. I almost had it. Close. Very close. Um, so my question for you is how do you balance being a practicing physician, infectious disease doctor with your involvement um, in Partners in Health and all these large projects? Well, you know, um, I'm very lucky in that, uh, in that respect. Um, and I've used, since I went to Harvard Medical School and trained at the Brigham, that's been my perch. And in those years, I mean, so for example, if you're on service seeing infectious disease consults, you're obviously not in Haiti or Africa. As the years have gone by, and I credit your generation with helping with this, global health has become more and more widely recognized as an important concern for an American university, and especially for an American medical center. In fact, um, we heard this today. Um, one of the Notre Dame faculty, two of the Notre Dame faculty, are studying some work that my colleagues from Chiapas are doing. My colleagues are here tonight. You should meet them, by the way. Hugo and Valeria, right here. Awesome peeps. Um, what they've seen is very much the, what we've seen is instead of the least well-trained um, students or least qualified students going into rural areas, they're trying to attract the best students um, by putting in place the staff stuff, space and systems and allowing idealistic young Mexican doctors recently graduated to participate. And that's what we have seen at Harvard as well, is that, you know, when, when I, 30 years ago when I was in medical school, a tiny little fraction of the staff, of the students were interested in global health disparities, and that's not just global, international. There are disparities in, you know, what state are we in again? Um, that's a little joke, Indiana, I know. <laughs> um, so the, a lot of the best people um, are, are clamoring for this kind of uh, material in their, in their courses and in their training. And that certainly happened at the, the hospital. 
So we move a lot of our clinical practice to Haiti, to Rwanda. Um, my colleague, uh, Peter Drobak, who just left, um, is heading up an, uh, an effort with our Rwandan colleagues to start a new University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda, um, which could have been the subject of a whole talk here. So um, global health is global. Universities, and I know I work at a very small um, community-based college in Cambridge, Massachusetts, <laughs> but this is why universities should be supporting their faculty and trainees and students, and, and likewise with uh, back and forth. So I think we're moving this needle forward. Anyway, I'm lucky. I get to do this full time. So do about 200 of my colleagues at Harvard. Okay, another question from back right. Hi, um, I know that you guys, uh, you, you spoke today most about Ebola, but uh, Partners in Health is involved in many different parts of the world and many different projects. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about what you think the most important factors are when you're making decisions about how to get involved and where to get involved in the many complex um, issues, you know, healthcare issues in the world. There's so many countries and so many, so many problems that need to be fixed that are so complex. What are, what are the most important issues and things that you take into account when trying to decide where Partners in Health should go and what, what kind of projects they should take on? And what's your name? Sarah. Um, and are you an undergrad? Yes, I am. Lexi, you? Well, um, these are not unrelated questions for me, and there's two. One of them is how does Partners in Health do this, but how should, maybe you're really asking how should you do it? Or, and that, that, you know, I know professors always say this kind of stuff, and you'll forgive me, but it's true. <laughs> you should find your way of getting involved. Now, Lexi have already busted me. How are you in two places at once? Okay, I'm not, <laughs> in, spite of my, in spite of my advanced Haitian training. Um, so you're, you're, if you're an undergraduate, you're supposed to be here. I already scolded Paolo for saying that I didn't go to class. That's not true. Well, kind of. And so you're, you live in South Bend, Indiana. There are health problems here. There are health problems across the world. And, um, you know, I'm headed out via Chicago tomorrow. Some people have called it a, a trauma desert. I mean, there's plenty of trauma, but not the care that you need. It's been the source of a big, and ultimately, I hope, fruitful debate in Chicago, that part of Chicago, that side of Chicago. So that's my advice to you as a, as a student. If you're interested in this, remember how I got interested in a classroom called, Medi it was a class called Medical Anthropology. I did my work for a paper work for a paper in the Duke Emergency Room. And uh, that's what got me hooked on this. And I started, I kept on working and, and writing uh, in Durham, North Carolina, which is where I lived, right? And then it was Haiti, and then it was Harvard, and places around Harvard. So there's always work to be done. I mean, locally is a bad word, but near where you are meant to be. How Partners in Health makes its decision is, decisions is a very different question. It started in that random, I believe that's the term your generation uses, <laughs> random way I mentioned, right? From ha to Haiti because the damn Fulbright Committee. <laughs> Plus, I, I went to a bunch of places in Haiti to volunteer and I got turned down by all of them. <coughs> ha, ha, ha. <laughs> they don't have a nice new hospital now, do they? You're not going to like tape that, are you? <laughs> um, oops, uh, I'm kidding. Uh, so, um, you know, it's happenstance, serendipity. Give your, you guys got to give yourselves a break, too. I mean, you're not going to, things aren't going to work out the way you want them to. Um, and that may be good, it may be bad, but it's definitely going to happen. It's often good, that kind of serendipity. Um, and that went on. I mean, we ended up in Peru, with Chiapas for complex reasons I'll discuss with my Mexican colleagues later on tonight. Peru, because there was a tuberculosis, a friend, uh, one of our board members went there, an American, and died of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. That's a sign, if ever there was one. By then, I was totally enamored of Father Gustavo Gutierrez's work, and then I got to work with him, which is pretty awesome, as we say in theological circles. <laughs> um, they probably actually do say awesome in theology, but they actually mean it. 
So, um, you know, and, and then Russia, because again, of clinical and what's called programmatic expertise we've gained in, in Peru. But in Africa, we actually sorted it through very carefully. We worked with the Clinton Foundation and ministries of health that wanted us to come there for a particular reason. Expertise in post-conflict areas in rural regions without staff stuff, space, and systems being the main one. So it, it varies over time. And if there's anything we can do to share our experience, both good and bad, um, then we will. Because we want it to be easier for this generation, as I said to Lexi, to be involved in addressing health disparities. Again, it doesn't mean far away. It could mean right up close to home. Like Evan goes between Chicago and Haiti. That's his practice. Um, so there's lots of ways. Well, you know, I'll just quote Gustavo. He said there are mil maneras, a thousand ways of serving the poor. And it's certainly true in my experience. Take one more. Thank you very much for your presentation. Again, yeah. my name is Lindora Hawadiawara. I'm from Liberia. And uh, thank you, by the way, for coming earlier as well. I'm sorry we didn't get to speak, and I hope you'll join our reception afterwards. Okay, Because I you. really, really love your country. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm very glad that you all are going to be doing some more work there in terms of building a hospital in the Hapa area. Um, the situation, it's, it's been very frustrating. And I'm, I'm just wondering, in terms of your own, your, your engagement in the country, what would you say is government's own, uh, uh, what, 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 what is government currently doing to try to do things differently? Because I know in, in, in Liberia, a lot of the help that we've gotten has been from outside, and there's this general belief that government doesn't want to change things. Mm -hmm. they, they, they want to place premium on infrastructure development, but on roads and so forth, and not really in the health and education sector. We just heard re recently that the, the primary uh, education sector is going to be handed over, the entire system will be handed over to Mark Zuckerberg and, and others. It will be privatized. So many things are happening and Liberians are already confused. So what do you see as government's own attempt to try to do things differently? And then the second question is in terms of the care, accompaniment and caring, caregiving. I know that one key challenge is the issue of burnout. Yeah. How do you all intend to deal with the issue of burnout as you go through this process of accompaniment? Thank you for both questions. You know, on the infrastructure side, I've heard the same things that you mentioned, but it's hard for me to see much evidence that there's been much success in building roads either. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, I, I, it, put it this way, I think it's a real mistake to invest in um, infrastructure with the claim that economic development is what drags up health. We can make a better argument, as you have, that health and education will drive up development. So I'm with you on that. Um, that said, uh, I've been, the Americans have this way of saying it probably given our long contact, you probably say the same thing. I've been underwhelmed by the infrastructure in any arena, in healthcare, education, roads. You know, I've heard about hydro and you know, we're, we would say bring it on just don't exclude healthcare and education, which is, again, I know a point that, that you've made as well. Um, you know, the privatization, these strategies of privatization, in a way, that's been Liberia's approach for 100 years. I mean, you don't see massive investments in public education and public health in 150 years in Liberia, right? And, uh, you do see, as I said, a lot of growth in the private sector, but it hasn't been readily translated into those basics. Uh, and then, of course, everything fell apart um, in the latter part of the 20th century, and what little there was was often destroyed. So attending to those matters, not as in competition, that is health and education versus economic infrastructure, that's the way forward. I would just like to add, as an outsider, um, meaning a non-Liberian who's new to the region, that a, a lot of those ideas, privatization, what used to be called and should still be called structural adjustment, 
those are not ancient Liberian ideas. Those are from outside too. That's development orthodoxy from the 70s and 80s. And you know, we should take some responsibility for that, I think, uh, meaning outsiders who are part of those institutions or wish to repair them so they do not continue to promote policies like structural adjustment that will neglect, neglect these basic, this freedom from want, um, which includes food security, basic education, not just basic education, education, healthcare. And uh, you can count on us to be pursuing that agenda as best we can, you know, given that we're new to the region. I, and I'll also say this, and getting back to the burnout question, I, I've never said this publicly, but I'm going to. Our strategy, people say, what's your strategic plan? What's your business plan? If they knew what our business plan was in going into Sierra Leone and Liberia, I don't think that a lot of major foundations would have supported it because it's very simple. We we're going to have two metrics. Sorry, I get worked up about this metrics. If I hear that again, <laughs> you know, I get people saying, "What's your KPI?" I'm like, "What's your KPI?" <laughs> First, it was, you know, well, that's not sustainable, and I'm thinking, "You're not sustainable." <laughs> so anyway. Our, our, our metrics were money out the door and people hired. And who were we hiring? We weren't hiring consultants. I mean, we didn't, I'm sure we gave Marie a huge salary. Right? We were hiring, we, we're the largest employer of Evola survivors in human history, with a, a thousand probably, maybe not quite a thousand, many more in Sierra Leone than Liberia. But 800 in Sierra Leone, not bad, huh? And Probably Partners in Health has 5,000 employees in West Africa now, or soon will. That's the, that's because we believe in human capital, like you do. And uh, now that's not gonna replace an experienced, oh sorry, an inexperienced nurse. In terms of babies, I mean, no, not babies, moms. Come on, I'm kidding. Go, go with my sense of humor, Marie. That's not going to replace a surgeon. That's not going to replace. So we, we, we have relied very heavily on Americans, Cubans, others, Haitians, for a lot of the professionals who aren't there. In Harper, for example, and I, I promise I'll close with burnout, but in Harper, for example, as elsewhere in the Sierra Leone and Liberia, all the medical schools, well, what few there were, nursing schools, what few there were, were closed, as were primary and secondary schools completely. And uh, so one of our jobs was to bring nurses who we'd worked with for many years, senior American nurses, to go and reopen the nursing school at Tubman in Harper, which they did. And every single one of the nurses passed her boards that year, this year. And that, that's, that's what we mean by investing in local capital. It's not going to be Marie who's going to be running the, the referral maternity hospital in, in, uh, in Freetown or I, who am the chief of infectious disease of J.J. Dawson. It's going to be our colleagues. Burnout can be lessened, one, by having partners and colleagues, right? If we have thousands of colleagues already, um, that lessens the chances for burnout. And it also lessens the chances of being deluded that we're going to go in and save the day. We know that's not true. We've already been through a lot of this. Another is if you make sure, and this has been something that Hugo and, and Valeria have been studying and, and effecting in their own work, as is evident. If you make sure the staff stuff, space, and systems are there, and that your colleagues, whether young or less young, like me and Marie, can actually make a difference, huge insurance against burnout. You know? And uh, those two interventions alone, having a big team and having the tools of the trade, are huge in, in investments in preventing burnout. They don't guard against war or violence or, you know, natural disasters, uh, but there is insurance against uh, burnout, I'm quite sure. And we, we would like to be twice as big there and have the proper staff stuff and space and systems that we need to be effective there over the long term. And that's going to be done through Liberian partners. So thank you all very much.